Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here this morning to give you an overview of using Snoozlin in mental health. Um, but I thought it might be quite useful just to start by introducing myself. Uh, my name's Leslie Collier. I'm one of the lecturers at the University of Southampton, where I teach occupational therapy and physiotherapy students, anatomy and neurology. And my particular research interest is in looking at the way we use multisensory approaches with people with cognitive impairment to actually improve their functional performance. It's an interesting area of work because I think it has been evolving over the last 20 years and certainly the work started off being used with people with learning disabilities but now we're using it across a range of different uh, clinical areas and we're just beginning to understand the impact of sensory input on our, our functional ability um, and there's a lot of research that's going on in this field looking at how we can improve quality of life, functional performance and also engagement for people with a, a range of different types of conditions. But this particular presentation this morning is going to focus a little bit more on the aspect of mental health, which is a reasonably new area within this particular field. So whilst I can't actually give you any sort of large-scale RCT evidence in this particular area, I will be relating back to some of the sort of neurophysiology and the way we understand the way the brain works to help you underpin your practice and also to help you present a sort of evidence base of why you're actually doing it to your colleagues and the doctors that you're actually working with. So just to start with, I thought we ought to define what we're talking about when we're talking about snoozling and multisensory environments. The key thing about the multisensory environment is it is a toolbox. And if you remember nothing else from this session, at the end of the day, I want you to walk away thinking it's a toolbox. That's the most important thing. There used to be an assumption that you could put people into a snoozling room, leave them there for 20 minutes until cooked, and something miraculous might happen to them. But we know that actually putting people into a room like this and just leaving them doesn't achieve anything. It is about that therapeutic interaction, it's about that therapeutic engagement that we have with an individual that is so important. So what we have here is a toolbox. And as you can see, I've got all my tools out at once in this particular toolbox. And that's another thing that wouldn't normally happen in real life. It's highly unlikely that you'd have everything switched on in a snoozling room all at once. And in many ways, you can actually encourage sensory overload if you've got everything on all at once. So this picture is here purely to illustrate some of the different pieces of equipment that you might have in a room. The other thing about this picture is it gives you a very strong indication of visual input. And in fact, it looks just a bit like a light show. And the other thing about a snoozling room is it is a range of sensory equ equipment across all the senses. So your toolbox just has something that stimulates sight, sound, touch, taste. Now I do say taste. And also smell. We will be exploring some of those particular aspects in relation to mental health a little bit later. Now when this first started out, uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Adfa Hull came up with the idea of trying to stimulate people with learning disabilities and he used everyday equipment. He designed what he called a sensory cafeteria and it was a room a little bit like this and you could walk into the room and then depending on what kind of stimulation you wanted you could go and have some visual stimulation or some tactile stimulation, and that might be just about getting your hands into rice or handling different types of fabrics. But people actually drove their intervention. They chose what it was they wanted to engage with. And there was a realization that working with this fairly challenging group that they needed equipment that was a little bit more robust. And hence, we've come up with uh, this type of equipment that you can see today. The key thing about this equipment that, yes, it is designed for people who might hand it, handle it in a more robust manner, but it also it's been designed to give very, very explicit sensory st stimulation. So, for example, if I switched off all the lights in this particular room and just had my bubble tube on, it would draw the attention of the individual towards that bubble tube. It would focus the attention. They wouldn't have problems with competing sensory stimulus coming at them. So the key thing is about, is about providing a very 
exclusive level of stimulation. That said, you can also get a degree of sensory stimulation from other areas of your everyday life. So if we think about this room here, we're getting quite a lot, or I'm getting quite a lot of visual stimulation from the lights in the ceiling, and that is drawing my attention. I'm having to concentrate quite hard to focus on you guys in the audience rather than being distracted by the other visual stimulus in the room. So we can use our toolbox as actually a graded form of activity from moving from that very explicit level of sensory stimulation into our everyday environment. So it's a tool that you can use in your graded therapeutic intervention. Along with developing the actual equipment, there has been a development in the way snoozling is actually used across different client groups. And in this particular slide, I've given you an indication of the breadth of its use. And whilst we are focusing on mental health in this particular session, there's a lot we can learn from the other client groups as well. The top one, learning disabilities, was where it originally came from. And the focus at that time was very much just about leisure and engagement and enjoyment, uh, rather than looking at a therapeutic um, interaction. That said, as occupational therapists, we know the value of leisure and engagement, so that is part of our therapeutic toolkit. In many ways, when you're looking at people with mental health uh, disorders, it's challenging for them to engage in those leisure activities and find focus in their everyday life, usually due to the complexity of leisure, general leisure activities. So what we could be doing is we could be using the snoozling room as pure leisure, pure go in there, find what you like, switch on the pieces of equipment that you like, and actually gain some engagement, get that state of flow by being so absorbed in an activity. So there are aspects of snoozling which can contribute in terms of leisure engagement. In terms of the work with older people, it is much more about trying to get people to focus and engage maybe on a single, sti sing single stimulus. This could be that, certainly for people with dementia, that there's an overwhelming amount of sensory information coming at them. And when I've been in nursing homes or on wards, the one thing I'm aware of is the busyness of what's going on around us. One thing that I have noticed being an occupational therapist has, is about pacing my level of input with a client. I'm very aware that I've got a very, big, very busy caseload, a very busy day, and I'm sort of trying to rush to get through it. But when I'm working with people with dementia, it's about slowing down my speech, my mannerisms, and actually the pace at which I'm taking them through an activity. That's not so different, again, with people with uh, mental health problems in the fact that very often they are feeling overstimulated by their world. Everything is actually coming at them. And so our interaction, our therapeutic use of self, is about slowing everything down. The one thing that you'll find when you go into a snoozling room is that for you, you probably feel that things are starting to slow down. It's slowing your pace of life. And in fact, I have a snoozling room at home. It's my bathroom. And when I've had a really, really busy day and I'm really, really feeling overwhelmed by information coming at me, I have my bath, I have my bubbles, so I've got some tactile input. I've got my aromatherapy candles. So I've got olfactory input. I've got soft lighting. I've got my Enya tape, low, slow music. And I've got my gin and tonic <laughs> for taste. And I'm using that multi-sensory approach to actually reduce the level of stimulation coming at me. I'm just going to skip ahead from mental health because we'll talk some more about that in a minute. But head injuries is another interesting area, looking at that low-level stimulation, increasing tolerance. Uh, and I'm always interested in this particular area of work because I happened to meet up with a nurse who was working with people with schizophrenia in Ireland. And she talked very much about increasing the level of stimulation that people were able to tolerate. And in her room, she had a bubble tube and she chose, she asked the uh, people who were using the room to choose their own music. So it was more familiar music rather than the more new agey music that you tend to hear. And within that, she used poetry reading. 
And it wasn't the sort of complex poetry that you might come across if you were studying English literature, literature, but more the kind of poems that we remember from our childhood, like The Owl and the Pussycat. Do you know that one? The Owl and the Pussycat went to sea in a, in a pea green boat. I can't remember all the words. But these were poems that people were able to sort of join in with, uh, with and they also have a very rhythmic kind of feel to them. And when I spoke to some of the people who were using this room, they said it helped them actually calm. It helped them say, OK, I can work at this level, and then increase the level of stimulation that they could actually tolerate as they were recovering. Another area, of it, um, area that's using Snoozlin is uh, maternity care. Um, and that sort of links in with the pain management aspect, the management of pain. We all know that when you're in pain, practicing relaxation techniques can have an impact on your perception of pain. So using something that doesn't have a large cognitive demand is quite useful. I don't know about any of you, but when I was in labor with my two children, the relaxation techniques that I was taught in the antenatal classes were of no use to me at all because I couldn't focus on being in a pleasant place because I was just overwhelmed with the sense of pain. But actually, when I've read articles about pain management in maternity care, women have reported that the snoozling room actually offers a level of relaxation without that cognitive demand. And again, that really fits in with mental health model in the fact that very often these individuals cannot cope with the overwhelming cognitive demand of a task. So we're looking to start with intervention that doesn't have a huge cognitive demand. And the final one on my list is about stress management. And of course, that fits very comfortably with the mental health arena. Interestingly, this came around because I was working with um, one of the reps with, from Romper, and she had a snoozling van. And she used to take this to conferences and let down the back of the van. And people used to come in, and they could look at the bubble tube and the optic fibers. And she could say, you know, here's our optic fibers. It costs this much. You could get them in different lengths. And she said to me one day, I don't think this is working. And I said, why is that? She said, people come into my van, they sit there, they relax, and they, then they start telling me about all the problems they've got with their wives and their kids. And I'm thinking, you know, that's not what I'm here for. Why are these people saying these things? And it suddenly occurred to me that it was that sort of low level, low stress environment that was causing these individuals to actually relax and open up. So in many ways, they're ideal places for allowing people time to think and reflect, maybe practice some mindfulness, and actually think about the situations they're in. And in fact, when I was a clinician, I used to take my manager into the snoozling room, leave him there for a little while, and he was malleable to all sorts of suggestions I had at the end of the day. Maybe I shouldn't be telling you that one. Anyway, a little bit more about the research that's uh, occurring in mental health. As I said, it's an emerging area of practice, so I can't offer you any hard-nosed RCT trials at this moment in time, although obviously these will come online soon. I've put um, the most recent one on that, that I'm aware of at the moment at the top, which is a study that I carried out with a psychologist in New York, Jason Stahl, and at the moment that, that one is uh, waiting to be published. But we were looking particularly at snoozling, stress management, and also about burnout. And we were using mental health nurses. We asked them to try a number of different relaxation techniques to manage their perception of stress. Um, and snoozling was found to have a much greater impact on things like heart rate, blood pressure, and also uh, reports of anxiety and depression. We were using the state traits scale to actually manage uh, to measure those particular aspects. Now this, um, although it was to do with stress management and it was to do with staff, obviously has implications for people who you might be working with, maybe on a more outpatient ba uh, basis, who are actually looking at uh, juggling their lifestyle and their life um, tasks that they have. But also the importance of using snoozling with staff because we all work in very high pressured environments and maybe it is also about you having time to go into the snoozling room to experience some stress management as well. 
The other studies I have selected are much more about looking at particular aspects of the snoozing environment that could impact on mental health. There was a very interesting article I picked up uh, which was about the use of virtual environments and the natural environment in, in mental health healing. And that's the next one down on my list. And in particular, they talked about the, the healing power of creating environments that were much more natural. And that made me think about some of the techniques we can use in a snoozling room. Um, certainly using things like the sound of the seashore or bird song having images that reflect the countryside might be something that people will find much more soothing rather than the sort of general clinical environment that we actually put them in. This particular study looked at the, the rate at heal, of healing as well, and they found that people who had access either to natural environments or could access environments that gave the impression of a naturalistic environment uh, had a faster turnaround within the hospital. So again, I think that has implications where you, have, you are having to look at fast turnovers with patients. The next study looked at, at alertness and snoozling. And in this particular study, they were looking at levels of arousal. Now, again, one thing that we know is that people in severe depression have not got very high levels of arousal. And often it, we're looking at trying to increase levels of arousal to enhance engagement in activity. And this particular study was looking at how we stimulate people up. Now, this is quite interesting because we often think of snoozling rooms to be about relaxation. But actually, for people who are operating at that low level, it isn't. It is about stimulating them up. So it's about being aware that you can turn the, the arousal volume up as well as turn it down in the snoozling room. And hence, the need for us as therapists to be aware that it is only a tool and we need to use it appropriately. The uh, last two studies I'm just going to talk to uh, talk about together because they do offer a similar kind of uh, message to us, and that's about using some of the sensory approaches that you can find in snoozling rooms to manage when people are out of control, um, and particular the work at the bottom that's being carried out by Tina Champagne. There's some very interesting work about using sensory rooms to reduce the level of restraint uh, and seclusion. And she cites work in her studies where they've noticed that actually uh, the number of uh, restraint uh, procedures that were carried out and the seclusion procedures that were carried out were reduced. And in fact, in one hospital, uh, within a series of six months, were reduced completely. Now, I think this is a, this is a very powerful message because in the news, it was two days ago, they were talking about a number of um, hospitals who were using restraint and the number of people who'd actually died as a result of restra restraint, and that's quite frightening. I think was, what was shocking for me was actually one of the hospitals was down in Southampton. Uh, and I was thinking, whoa, you know, that's, that's, that's very close to me. Now, Tina and her team are discover discovering that using sensory approaches can have a profound impact on uh, levels of seclu seclusion and restraint. So maybe we need to be thinking about this as an alternative to some of the uh, other techniques we're using. I think what we do need to do, though, because there is a limited amount of research out there, is start to think about where it fits in a theoretical framework. And this particular slide is based on Piaget's work of sensory motor development, and it's a, it's a model that I use in a lot of my research. And I think it's quite useful to set this in context of mental health. So on the, the left of the, the model, we have our sensory level. And if we're thinking about normal development, the first line here, the sensory level is the newborn baby, the baby who is responding on a purely sensory level, sight, sound, touch, taste, smell. All our interactions with the child on this level are at that, that point. We rock the baby. We pull big faces. We speak with a squeaky voice. We use our senses to actually interact with that individual. Now, as the baby develops, uh, they start to make sense of their world. You know, the dropping the things over the edge of the high chair is all about developing an understanding about gravity. Playing with toys is all about hand-eye coordination, which, as you know, is one of the precursors to learning to, to dress and interact with our world. 
So once you've actually got beyond your perceptual level, then we start to engage with our world, which is where we have skill acquisition. That's our normal process of development as we understand it. Now, when you're looking at people with mental health uh, challenges, very often, although they still have skill acquisition, their level of functional ability is dropping off, depending on the severity of the condition that they actually have. So somebody who has a, a very acute anxiety episode or a very severe depression is often only operating on this sensory level. So the activities that we need to be engaging with with this individual need to be at this level with our aspiration that we're building them upwards. So this is a tool that you can start off with. The snoozlin is a tool that you can start off with, with the plan that you're obviously going to increase the level of complexity of sensory input that they start to then move out of the snoozlin room and actually can manage their sensory demands around them within the confines of maybe the OT department or within the ward before they actually move back out into our wild, wider world and are actually, actually having to deal with the, the varying levels of demand that we might have going on around us and also the unpredictability of the sensory input that, that, that is demanded of us in our everyday world. The other thing that we need to be mindful of is the way the different senses are going to impact on that as well. So whilst we might be starting at that sensory level, we need to think about how do each of these sensory areas impact on us in terms of our uh, cognitive performance. So if we start with our, this is our toolbox, so if we're going to start with sight at the top, we all know that if I dropped you guys into a nightclub, you would be pretty stimulated. You'd be there, you'd be jigging away, the flashing lights would be stimulating you, you'd be wanting to move. Uh, we do know that that kind of fast, bright light stimulation is going to stimulate you up. So when you're looking at your snoozling room, you need to be thinking about, okay, have I got something that's got a low level uh, stimulation, may a much more constant light, and what have I got that gives me that fast level of stimulation? So actually I can adjust my client up from that low level stimulation to, to higher level stimulation. It's also worth thinking about the sound we're actually using. I think historically we've always gone with the sort of new age mu music-y kind of feel, um, but you don't need to have that kind of music. You can have whatever kind of music you want in a snoozling room. I've been in music, uh, snoozling rooms with classical music, heavy rock, my Enya, <laughs> which would be my preference, but the music has to be to your particular choice. I think the key thing to remember in terms of auditory stimulation is the rate and the tempo of the music that you're hearing. We know that anything that is heartbeat rate or faster is going to be more stimulating, heartbeat and less is going to be more relaxing. So again, being mindful of what is it you're trying to achieve with your toolbox. If you've got somebody who you're trying to increase the level of arousal and, and tolerance to sensory input, then obviously you're going to choose music that is much more uh, stimulating. Now, alongside that, you can link your auditory stimulation in with some of the vibration aspects. So vibration has actually an inhibitory action on brain activity. So we know deep vibration, and you've probably had sort of sat in these vibrating chairs and felt how relaxing it is. That has an inhibitory action. So if you've got somebody who is quite over aroused, you might choose music that has low level tempo, below heartbeat rate, but also with lots of bass in it, so you're getting some of that vibration. It's always interesting when you hear these, these young men in cars going by, and you can hear the bass, can't you? You don't hear the music, you just hear this boom, boom, boom as the car goes by. For them, particularly because there's a high level of testosterone in adolescence, you're going to get that inhibitory action through the vibration in the seat. So it actually helps them modulate their level of arousal. So it's their way of just uh, managing their level of arousal in an everyday situation. Then we've got um, touch. And we've already talked about vibration, but obviously we've got the somatosensory aspect of touch. Anything that is light and smooth and consistent is going to have an inhibitory um, 
sorry, not, not light, it, anything that's going to be smooth and fairly heavy is going to have a, an inhibitory action on the sensory system. And I'm sure you're all aware of things like weighted blankets have quite a powerful impact on levels of arousal. That can be very useful when you're looking at people who have sleep disorders associated with mental health, uh, because that will um, often help them reduce their level of arousal sufficiently that they can sleep. In fact, there's some in very interesting work that has been published fairly recently looking at the use of uh, weighted blankets and levels of arousal and sleep patterns uh, with people with mental health problems. Whereas, so light touch and random touch is much more stimulating. And any of, those, any of you who've worked in neuro will know all about things like fast tapping, which is used to actually increase activity in muscles. Well, there we're trying to increase levels of um, functionality, so we're increasing the level of stimulation. So we're using a lot of the sort of neurodevelopmental techniques within the snoozling room as well to, ma to manage the level of arousal for individuals. I mentioned taste right at the beginning, and I'm sure most people are often um, a little surprised when you start talking about taste. But think about the things that you eat that actually are stimulating or relaxing. Things like citrus fruits are known to have a stimulating response. How many of you, when you're in the car on a long journey, eat things like peppermints? Because actually it's stimulating. It's your way of trying to keep your arousal level up. Whereas for me, when I'm feeling stressed, I tend to eat things like chocolate. Same for you. Because actually it's sort of creamy consistency is actually calming for me and that sucking action which when you look back to the sort of sensory uh, model that I had put on previously is going back to that sensory level that the child's actually going through uh, which will reduce levels of arousal so taste is quite powerful in that respect and so is smell the key thing about smell is the uh, olfactory nerve goes straight into the limbic system which is why when you walk into Tesco's or Sainsbury's and you smell donuts, you get that sort of feel-good feeling because very often eating those kinds of foods are associated with treats and feeling good. So using smell can be, again be a powerful tool for some of the patients we're working with with mental health disorders. It's about finding out from maybe doing diaries and histories with them what kind of things evoke positive memories. And that might be something like smelling the seashore because it's associated with positive memories and holidays and things like that. Or it might be associated with food that gives you a feel-good factor. So creating sort of sensory diaries alongside the snoozling room is also a good way to try and actually work out which tools we should be using within it. And then finally on my, in my toolbox, I have something for vestibular and proprioceptive stimulation. Now, the use of these two areas is particularly powerful when you're relating it with sensory integration theory. We know that vestibular input has a very powerful impact on modulation of mood and arousal, just because of the neurodynamics, the way, the way they work uh, in our neural system. But what we do know is that with vestibular, that it has a powerful effect both in stimulating up but also relaxing down. So if we use something that is in a linear plane, so for example, sitting on a rocking horse or uh, maybe sitting in a rocking chair if it's for an older person, then you're going to get that linear, rea re linear reaction. And that has an inhibitory action on our brain, so it's a calming effect. It's what we do with babies, isn't it? We rock them in a linear fashion to, to actually help them get to sleep. We don't sort of spin them around when we're trying to reduce their level of arousal. In contrast, anything that involves spinning is going to be stimulating. So a much more random effect, um, a random movement will affect uh, levels of arousal. Now, rather than sticking people on spinning objects in snoozling rooms, what I tend to do is it, I tend to place equipment in various areas so people actually have to reach beyond their midline and there's a much more random aspect to the way they move around the room to try and get that effect. So you're using the equipment and the environment to actually get those kind of effects. The other aspect I just wanted to highlight on before I finish is the use of assessment. Um, and this is imp an imperative 
part of our Snooslin toolbox, the assessment. I've already mentioned about using sensory diaries, which I think is a very powerful way about finding out about people's preferences and also the way you're going to use your sensory approaches. But other tools that I have found useful in my travels have been the adult sensory profile, which is Winnie Dunn's tool. And this will tell you about people's ability to tolerate levels of stimulus, so where their sensory threshold is whether they need a lot of stimulation before they respond, or maybe they're sensory sensitive and they don't need much before they, they actually respond to that level of stimulus. That will help you choose whether you go with something that's sort of quite sort of explicit and intense, or whether you go for something that's a little bit more subtle within the room. The other, other tool that you can use is the sensory profiling tool, which is um, an assessment tool that Romper produce. And this just helps you to, again, to work out where people's sensory preferences lie, whether they're more an olfactory kind of person, a tactile kind of person, or a visual kind of person. Um, for, certainly for adults, the pool activity levels of occupational profiling is another useful tool. And although this was originally designed for people with dementia, it can also be used with other client groups. And I have used it with people with more severe levels of depression and this will look at levels of engagement with activity not only will it look at engagement across lots of different activities but there's also details within the book about how you might run a, a snoozling session given the level somebody is at is actually at and that is particularly useful if you're looking at trying to discharge people on or maybe working with nursing homes where you might want to give some advice to carers about how to use the room and one other that I've come across that I haven't got on my list but I think is worth mentioning is the sensory integration inventory, um, which will also give you a checklist to look at where which sensory area is um, over-responsive or under-responsive uh, for that particular individual and again will help you choose the right tool for out of our toolbox. I'm going to stop talking at this point because I think it'd be good for us to actually have opportunities for some questions. But I have got a number of reference lists that are available to you, and there are uh, information sheets available to you. And I would suggest what you do, you can either email me, and I've got my email address on there, or you can actually get this information from Romper. So if you call at the Romper stand and say you want some information, they can email it all through to you as well. So. Hopefully, what I've provided you with is a very swift overview about the way we use snoozel in, in mental health and where it's going and some of the theory bases that underpin it. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. <laughs>